and welcome to Within the Frame, where we bring today's most pressing global issues into focus. I'm Kim mo -gyan. Leaders and representatives from 21 APEC member countries held two days of official meetings in Peru. The summit's key outcomes included the reaffirmation of support for multilateral trade systems through the Machu Picchu Declaration and a fresh perspective on the free trade area of the Asia-Pacific agenda in the Ishima Statement. During the summit, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol also held a series of separate summits with world leaders. These include trilateral talks with U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba, where they focused on the growing threat from North Korea. The three leaders uh, issued a joint statement reaffirming their commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula under the U.N. Security Council resolutions. For more on this, we are joined online by Christophe Godang, professor of political science at Kungmin University. Welcome to the program, professor. Good evening. Thanks for having me. And also joining us is Hana Kim, assistant professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at Sagang University. Thank you for joining us, professor. Thanks for having me. So let's start with Professor Kim. The 2024 APEC summit concluded with a reaffirmation of the vision for shared development based on multilateral trade. So let me ask first, how would you evaluate the outcomes of this summit? So in terms of engaging in cl closer cooperation, it seems as though the outcomes of the summit could be viewed to be relatively successful. APEC has long been uh, viewed as a protector of the multilateral trading system since it started in 1989. And this recent summit has actually shown that APEC is still working to sustain this position of promoting free, inclusive, and sustainable trade throughout the Asia-Pacific region. And the leaders of all of the 21 member economies called for enhancing and strengthening free trade and connectivity, and they reaffirmed support for a rules-based multilateral system amid growing concerns over the spread of protectionism that we're seeing worldwide. And this could really be seen through this summit, where APEC leaders held bilateral and trilateral meetings to reaffirm their partnerships and uh, deepen their cooperation. So, for example, South Korea and Peru agreed to deepen their cooperation in mineral trade, investment, and infrastructure, and they signed multiple Memorandum of Understandings, or MOUs. And this is especially fruitful since South Korea will host APEC next year and has already been planning to focus on creating a stable supply chain with APEC member economies. Right. What about uh, Professor Godong? Uh, how would you assess the overall outcome of APEC this year? Well, what, what we've been witnessing, in my opinion, mostly it is a series of, of attempts, more or less organized attempts, to, to face the situation created by the election of Donald Trump. Because you know that APEC stands for Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, but economic cooperation here in the mind of the organizers means mostly trade, and more importantly, free trade. Over its 25 years of existence, the APEC has consistently been pushing for lowering tariffs. This resulted in a growing interdependence between all of these economies in the Pacific region. And now what we see is that all of these economies in Asia, in Australia, in Latin America, de depend heavily on U.S. markets. And President Trump, all over his campaign, has been flagging tariffs, tariffs on imports to America of 10 to 20 percent, up to 16 percent for Chinese goods. So now, uh, as growth is slowing down all over the world, even more so in China, all, what all of these leaders are trying to do is to try to somehow adjust to the situations they've created. For instance, this uh, giant mega port project that China has been announcing in Latin America, this 1.3 billion project that China has been announcing in, in Peru, is a way first, obviously, to try to replace the US uh, in the role of the economic leader in the region. And at the same time, it is a way to try to boost for this Chinese economy that has been ailing for a couple of years now. Right. So a lot of events happening uh, at the summit. Now, on the sidelines of the summit, Professor Godang, uh, President Yoon suk yeol met with Chinese President Xi Jinping to discuss North Korea's provocations and growing military cooperation with North Korea and Russia. Uh, 
and they urged China to play a constructive role over there. Now, Xi Jinping has also agreed on the necessity for keeping peace on the Korean Peninsula. Now, after two years of no formal talks between South Korea and China, what is your take on this latest meeting? And um, do you think there would be a change in China's actions moving forward? In fact, here, I think we can be quite straightforward, even blunt in a way, because peace for China in the first place means trade. And trade China needs in order to export these commodities that are now not absorbed by domestic consumption in China. You, you always need to remember that, of course, North Korea can be useful to China because it is China only main ally in the region. But when it comes to trade, China trades with South Korea up to 30 to 35 times more than with North Korea. So what China needs for now is somehow North Korea to, to cool down a bit. Because now China's top priority is to boost exports. So this is why China has been taking a somehow friendlier stance with South Korea, but also towards Japan. And when a China means that the approach needs to be constructive, constructive to what? Constructive to more trade is what it means, in my opinion, mostly. Right, so the, cha um, the change in China's actions could come from uh, because South Korea is a bigger trade partner than North Korea is. Yes. Yeah. You, you, you know, when it comes to China, the bottom line is never ideology. It is always money. Mm -hmm. uh, then what about uh, Professor Kim? There's been some analysis suggesting a subtle shift in China's stance on the Korean Peninsula, like we just touched upon. Now, uh, they, before, they, they were defending North Korea, but now they are instead emphasizing South Korea's responsibility. What do you think is behind this change in tone? Yeah, so it seems as though China's stance on the Korean Peninsula is has been subtly shifting, as you mentioned. You know, for example, China recently extended a visa-free policy to South Korea, where South Korean passport holders can now visit China without a visa for up to 15 days. Um, but also, and Professor Gordon also touched upon this, Trump's return to the U.S. presidential office is influencing China's stance because Trump is well known for his skeptical regarding the value of the alliance system. Um, it's been widely accepted that Trump will also continue the, uh, to pursue the so-called American first policy. And as Professor God mentioned, you know, he's also been talking about universal tariffs of 10% to all countries. So there's a high possibility that Trump will renegotiate also the defense burden sharing uh, with South Korea. And this situation provides China with a strategic chance to win over US allies, including South Korea. But at the same time, China's not very happy with the recent rapprochement between North Korea and Russia and their newly signed Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Treaty, which obligates the two countries to assist each other militarily in the event of the war. So. And along with this, it's said that North Korea has deployed as many as 12,000 troops to help Putin's war effort. So ultimately, all of these elements are making China seek this sort of subtle shift in its position in the Korean Peninsula. Right. These developments could kind of be an opportunity for China's perspective. Uh, now, Xi Jinping placed a strong emphasis on bilateral economic cooperation during his meeting with uh, South Korean President Yoon sung yeol uh, And Chinese state media highlighted China's role in promoting regional economic cooperation through genuine multilateralism. Professor Godong, could this be a sign, a response to the strengthening trilateral cooperation between South Korea, U.S. and Japan? Oh, yes, certainly, because here I think we need to get back to the point Professor Kim has just made, because here uh, we've got actually two shifting movements taking place at the same time. One is North Korea's shifting to Russia, because for now the, the priority is geopolitical. It is about asserting the ideological stance. And the other one is China's trying to boost 
the, the ailing economy by opening markets all over the region. So when uh, Xi Jinping is uh, calling for what he calls genuine, genuine multilateral cooper cooperation, he means that first, he is trying to somehow make up for the losses that are to be generated by the tariffs. Trump are, is to implement so by exporting more to Asia when China is, is in no position to keep exporting as much to the US. And second, somehow he is pushing for some sort of peace offering to uh, Korea and to Japan, which is in a way, he's somehow offering a sort of trade off, literally. He says that, well, we will trade more. And as a result, our political differences, somehow we will put them aside. That's China is trying to turn this, this crisis that is resulting from the election of President Trump into some sort of opportunity. They are trying to, to make up the best they can with these situations that they didn't want in the first place. Right. Just like our Professor Godal mentioned, during the U.S.-China summit, the issue of North Korea's military ties with Russia has been raised, and President Biden called on China to prevent further North Korean troop deployments to Russia, while Xi Jinping reiterated China's stance on protecting its strategic security interests. Now, while the broad framework remains the same, there are still clear differences in details. Professor Kim, how do you interpret this divergence? Yeah, so you know, the U.S., the United States has been asking China to exert its influence over North Korea to essentially keep it in check. And this is because 90 percent of North Korea's foreign trade relies on China, which gives China significant leverage over Pyongyang. But China maintains that North Korea's military support to Russia is a bilateral matter between those two countries and unrelated to China. So for China, however, persuading North Korea is challenging and applying pressure can also risk pushing North Korea closer to Russia. So they're playing this game, you know, between the three countries where um, potential pushes could lead uh, one country to move closer to another country. And so there's the possibility that North Korea might respond with even more provocative actions. And so from China's perspective, maintaining stability on the Korean Peninsula takes precedence over the war between Russia Russia and Ukraine, which is more geographically farther away. But that being said, President Xi Jinping this time has made a slightly stronger than usual statement by emphasizing that China will not tolerate threats to its security or core interests when talking about the Korean Peninsula. So this message, while it was directed at the United States, it can also be interpreted as a signal to North Korea, since historically, North Korea has often timed its provocations to coincide with transitions in U.S. administrations. So this nuance can't be overlooked. Right. So it's also a message. It's a bilateral, I mean, two-way message uh, right. to North Korea and also the U.S. Now, there's also the issue of Taiwan. Uh, both President Biden and President Xi Jinping reiterated their respective positions, but it appears they were unable to find common ground. Uh, Professor Godang, what could this mean for the future of U.S.-China relations moving forward? Well, I'm afraid that anything that President Biden has said is unfortunately to be overlooked because he won't be in office in a couple of months. And uh, what, what, it's always difficult to tell what, he, what is happening in the mind of Donald Trump. But one of the few things we know for sure is that Donald Trump is an isolationist. What matters to him is America and uh, the rest of the world, he considers it to be some sort of liability. So Taiwan is not as central in his foreign policy as it used to be for, for his predecessors. So now, uh, at the same time, the, the, I, I think that to understand what is happening in China, we need to focus on China as well, because China, so just like America, cares 
relatively little for what is happening in the rest of the world. But the catch is that from the Chinese point of view, Taiwan is a part of China. So China is right now, in my opinion, China cares much more about taking Taiwan back than the US under Trump's presidency, at least under the Trump administration, then America cares to protect Taiwan. So the election of Trump combined with uh, the Chinese, the Chinese Communist parties being tempted to use uh, Taiwan as a sort of, of scapegoat in order to make up for for the for the failures for the failures economically speaking what is happening now is that the chinese economy is slowing down so the chinese communist party is trying to make up with some inflammatory nationalistic rhetoric which includes eventually obviously getting back getting taiwan back into the motherland and at the same time as far as we can tell it is very unlikely that a Trump administration is to is to take a very strong stance in order to defend Taiwan. So as far as we can tell, and here I'm being, I'm being as cautious as I can, all of this is probably bad news for Taiwan and the Taiwanese people. Right. So we'll have to keep how, keep watch on how things uh, develop at that front. Now, after a month. Following their October meeting, President Yoon sang yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba met again, emphasizing closer cooperation due to the shifting international situation, especially the North Korea-Russian military ties. They also discussed continuing the so-called shuttle diplomacy. Uh, Professor Kim, how would you evaluate the latest, latest summit? It seems as though South Korea and Japan relations have improved quite a bit recently. Um, as you mentioned, President Yoon and Prime Minister Ishiba held their second in-person bilateral meeting to strengthen Korea-Japan relations during the APEC summit, and both have expressed strong concerns over the North Korean-Russia military ties. So because of this, they agreed to elevate bilateral relations between the two countries since close coordination and cooperation is important to counter security challenges. And this is because the deepening security cooperation between North Korea and Russia poses serious concerns not only for South Korea, but also for Japan, which has its own territorial disputes with Russia. So in this context, reaffirming close diplomatic coordination between South Korea and Japan is of great importance. And shuttle diplomacy between South Korea and Japan was initially reinstated during the tenure of former Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. And after Kishida stepped down, the Ishida cabinet was inaugurated. And Ishida has been expected to follow Kishida's foreign policy line. But last month, electoral defeat of the ruling party has sparked discussions of Ishiba's early resignation. So naturally, questions are arising about the continuation of shuttle diplomacy. But amidst this type of uncertainty with Japanese diplomacy, still the reaffirmation of shuttle diplomacy between South Korea and Japan holds significant meaning. It shows that the commitment of both nations are trying to maintain amicable relations. And in this way, Restoring relations is has been one of President Yoon's significant diplomatic achievements, and it's been an important step for both countries to collaborate more closely together. Right, and that's some good news to hear. Now, at the trilateral summit between South Korea, U.S., and Japan, a joint statement condemning the legal North Korea-Russian military cooperation has been issued, and a new trilateral cooperation office was established. What do you see the significance in this, Professor Kim? Yeah, so, um, you know, President Yoon, President Biden, and Prime Minister Shiba met for about 40 minutes to reaffirm their trilateral security partnership with the three countries uh, strongly condemning North Korea's deployment of troops to Russia and its involvement in the conflict and making a joint statement regarding this. So, as you mentioned, they agreed to establish a trilateral secretariat to ensure a cooperative framework to further align objectives and actions. And in order... 
Through this, they decided to rotate it, their leadership every two years, with South Korea, the United States, and Japan taking turns. And they've been hoping to establish this soon. Um, but this trilateral summit and the discussions that took place will most likely be the last with President Biden, since he's going to be stepping down as president. You know, the, their first meeting of, between the three countries was in August 2023, the historic Camp David summit. Um, and since then, the three countries have been continuing to show ongoing progress. But as we've kind of been alluding to throughout this um, entire time, the return of Trump is going to change a lot of mm -hmm. things regarding foreign policy. You know, President-elect Donald Trump champions the American first foreign policy, and he may be unlikely to maintain this new trilateral secretariat for coordinating and implementing their shared commitments. And previously, Trump has boasted about his friendship with Kim Jong-un, and they've met in a series of summits. Um, but Kim Jong-un's attitude may have changed this time around, even though Trump's back, um, because of the strengthening relationship bet between Russia and North Korea, Kim Jong-un's attitude may have changed. North Korea may be more emboldened and possibly more dangerous. And even recently, North Korea has been critical of U.S. support of Ukraine and has called for limitless expansion of their military nuclear program to counter U.S.-led threats after South Korea, the U.S., and Japan met. So despite Trump's win, Kim Jong-un, who's now backed by Russia, may be less likely to be open to the kind of diplomacy that we saw during Trump's first term. So a lot of this is ultimately going to depend on whether Trump continues on with the trilateral summit. Uh, but President Yoon has expressed hope that the trilateral framework will continue to receive support from U.S. and the next president. Right, so we'll have to see how things flow under the second term presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, thank you so much for your insights tonight, Professor Kim and Professor Godong. We'll have to wrap up our discussion here. Thank you so much for your expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for joining us on Within the Frame. Be sure to tune in again next time as we continue to explore the stories that matter. Until then, stay informed and engaged.